spring 1954. This was when the first idea for the world's most famous monster movie franchise would officially start. And funnily enough, it started in an airplane of all places. Tomoyuki Tanaka was a Japanese film producer that started his career in 1945. Throughout the rest of the 40s and into the early 50s, he would contribute to several films, but eventually found himself working for Toho Studios under his boss Iwao Mori. The reason why he was on this plane in spring of 1954 was because he was attempting to save a Toho producer movie called In the Shadow of Honor that was supposed to be a Japanese-Indonesian co-production. However, according to the official Godzilla compendium by J.D. Lees and Mark Sarazini, the Indonesian government had denied work visas for the Japanese actors that were meant to feature in the movie. According to Japan's favorite monster, the unauthorized biography of the Big G by Steve Rifle, this was due to the leftover tensions the Dutch East Indies had with Japan as the latter had taken over the former during World War II almost a decade earlier. As a result, the movie was halted and soon cancelled. Tanaka was on the plane to go over in the hopes of negotiating a deal with the Indonesian government to no avail. He was told by Mori that, instead of trying to save In the Shadow of Honor, he was to come up with a new movie idea for Toho. Not wanting to be on Mori's bad side, Tanaka stressed to come up with a new movie idea. However, the pressure to come up with something seemed to have pushed Tanaka to think big. Really big, because he would eventually come up with the perfect idea for a movie. A movie about a giant monster. This monster would later become Godzilla. Now, the idea of a monster movie didn't just come out of nowhere. In fact, the story goes a bit deeper than that. It all goes back to 1933's King Kong. 1933's King Kong was a milestone for the American film industry, not only showing off a new wave of quality to stop motion animation, but also starting a whole new genre of monster movies. 1933's King Kong was not just a success during its initial release. Its debut was no doubt an absolute success, but this success would lead to several re-releases, none more successful than its 1952 re-release. Not just because of the amount of money it would make, but also the things it would end up inspiring. Firing. King Kong's 1952 release was so popular it would bring in between 2.5 and 3 million dollars, Time Magazine would label the titular ape as the monster of the year, and it would kickstart the trend of other movie studios to release their own giant monster movies throughout the 50s, including one studio known as Mutual Films of California. And this is where our story kind of starts. Because movie producers Jack Dietz and Hal E. Chester from Mutual Films would go on to conceive a movie idea that would eventually become known as The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms. The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms is often considered to be one of the inspirations for the creation of Godzilla. And it makes sense, as there are several elements from the American-produced monster movie that are taken and even improved upon in the Japanese counterpart. But we're getting ahead of ourselves a bit. What exactly led up to The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms? To answer that question, we have to go earlier in the 50s, more specifically June 23rd, 1951. This was the year that famous science fiction author Ray Bradbury would release a short story called The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, which would later be retitled to the Foghorn for reasons that I'll get into later. The story is about a pair of men, Johnny and McDunn. The two worked out on a lonely lighthouse by a bay that was empty for a hundred miles, manning the Foghorn to direct ships out at sea. However, during this time of year, it wasn't ships that McDunn was expecting. The story begins with McDunn, an older man who had been working at the lighthouse for three years up to that point, who warns the young Johnny, who had only been working at the lighthouse for three months, that a strange occurrence happens at this point in time every year, one that only McDunn up to this point had witnessed. Without going into specifics at first to prevent the risk of sounding crazy, McDonough explains that something emerges from the water around this time of year, and as they wait for this thing to emerge, McDonough also explains his theory for why this may be. How someone built this lighthouse here to create a sound that no ship can miss. A sound that has the ability to break through all silence in the world. 
We need a voice to call across the water to warn ships. I'll make one. I'll make a voice like all of time and all of the fog that ever was. I'll make a voice that is like an empty bed beside you all night long. And like an empty house when you open the door. And like trees in autumn with no leaves. A sound like the birds flying south, crying. And a sound like November wind and the sea on the hard, cold shore. I'll make a sound that's so alone that no one can miss it. That whoever hears it will weep in their souls and hearths will be warmer. And being inside will seem better to all who hear it in the distant towns. I'll make me a sound and an apparatus and they'll call it a foghorn. And whoever hears it will know the sadness of eternity and the briefness of life. Shortly after McDunn's explanation, the sea begins to stir and soon a head rises out from the water. Following it, a long serpent-like neck that brings the head 40 feet above the water. The creature makes its way towards the lighthouse where Johnny realizes why it comes here every year. As the foghorn lets out its loud call, the creature from the sea responds by bellowing an almost identical call. The creature, described to be a dinosaur of sorts, was just a lonely animal, the last of its kind, that's responding to a call that sounds like its own, hoping that it's finally run into another one of its kind. The two men watch in awe before McDunn decides to turn off the horn to see what happens. When the calls from the tower abruptly stop, the dinosaur realizes that the calls were nothing more than artificial, causing it to become angry. So angry that it begins to attack the lighthouse, forcing the men downstairs into a cellar at the bottom floor. As the building comes crashing down as a result of the dinosaur's wrath and frustration from its everlasting loneliness. The dinosaur returns to the vast and lonely seas, and the following morning, the men are rescued by others who dig up the rubble away from the cellar door. McDunn lies and says the building had come crashing down due to unexpected powerful waves at the bay, and Johnny plays along with it. As the two know, no one would ever believe their story. A year would go by, and the men went about their lives, with Johnny finding work in town, and even getting married and settling down. Eventually, he would return to the bay, where a new lighthouse had been built and was being ran by McDunn, who confirms to Johnny that the monster never came back. It's gone away. It's gone back to the deeps. It's learned you can't love anything too much in this world. It's gone into the deepest deeps to wait another million years. Ah, the poor thing, waiting out there and waiting out there, while man comes and goes on this pitiful little planet. Waiting and waiting. As mentioned earlier, the foghorn came from the mind of famed sci-fi and fantasy author Ray Bradbury. During the early 50s, Bradbury had been living in Venice, California, and one day he had been taking a walk on the beach with his wife when the two came across the destruction of the Venice Pier, which seemed to have been undergoing a demolition process at the time. Among the destruction was the skeleton of a roller coaster which seemed to have some sort of resemblance to a dinosaur. A couple of nights later, in a separate instance, Bradbury is awoken one evening by loud calls in the distance, eventually realizing they were the calls of the foghorns of distant lighthouses. With that, he put the two elements together to create a story about a lonely dinosaur from the sea that comes to seek for the origins of the foghorn calls only to get frustrated to find out it's just a lighthouse and not one of its own kind, leading to it destroying the building in anger. Bradbury wasted no time as he would write the story in just three hours the following day, where he would then send it to the Saturday Evening Post, an American magazine that would feature articles on current events and politics from around the world, along with featuring literary works from authors like Bradbury. Apparently, the editors at the Saturday Evening Post immediately bought Bradbury's story as the author had become a household name for the world of literature, so featuring anything he wrote would no doubt do well for their magazine. And this would hold very true a especially for his Beast from 20,000 Fathoms short story. Because a couple of years later, the short story would end up leading to a brief period of confusion regarding its eventual yet loose movie adaptation, and how it was being made using similar elements to Bradbury's story without the knowledge of the author himself, at least at first. So this is where the story gets a bit murky, as there are different people with different stories and ideas for how things really went. Let's start with Mutual Films. 
As mentioned earlier, there were two movie producers that helped run this company, Jack Dietz and Hal Chester. The two were inspired by the 1952 release and success of King Kong, so as a result, the two producers wanted to make not one, not two, but three low-budget monster movies. For the first monster movie, it was given the title of The Monster from Beneath the Sea, and it was planned to be centered around a dinosaur-like monster that's awoken from its several million year long dormant state after the explosion explosions of nearby atomic bomb tests. As far as I've read, an outline for the movie was written, the producers reached out and offered the director's chair to art and production designer Eugene Laurier, which ended up being his directorial debut. And along with him, they also got Ray Harryhausen to do all of the creature effects for their monster. And this all happened after Brad Berry released his own dinosaur short story for the Saturday Evening Post. While I haven't ran into any sources that state Dietz or Chester's side of the story from their perspective, Mark F. Berry's 2002 book The Dinosaur Filmography does state a point where the director, Eugene Laurier, had been working with another writer on expanding the outline that Dietz and Chester started before they ended up finding Brad Berry's short story through the Saturday Evening Post, which they liked very much. Dietz also realized the potential of adding Brad Berry's title to their movie and the popularity it could garner from it as his name was huge in the world of science fiction and literature. So according to Laurier's account of the story, they bought the rights to the Beast from 20,000 Fathoms and added a lighthouse segment in their outline for their movie. However, from Bradbury's perspective, he would actually catch them red-handed on attempting to take elements from his story, and only then did the people at Mutual Films attempt to purchase the rights to it. In the dinosaur filmography, there's a segment that details a time where Bradbury explained he was actually approached by the producers to read the outline for the monster from beneath the sea, not telling him that certain elements of his story were being used, which is where he would catch the similarities between their movie outline and his short story. In a 2003 DVD release of the Beast from 20,000 Fathoms movie, there was a featurette included called Harryhausen and Bradbury, an unfathomable friendship, where the two had been brought back to talk about their experiences in their respective fields of special effects and writing, and how that overlapped between the two industries and their friendship. During this interview, Bradbury explains that he was contacted by Mutual Films and was actually invited over to their studio to go read their outline, in the hopes that he would maybe help them with their movie, as Bradbury was not only an author, but also a screenwriter. The author would do this without the knowledge that his story was being used in any way, and would return from the other room immediately pointing out the similarities between their outline and his story, which seemed to have taken the producer by complete surprise. I went to the studio and they showed me the screenplay and said, will you go in the next room and read it and tell us if you'll help us with this. So I went in the next room and I read what they had and I came back and intuitively said, uh, excuse me, but this sort of reminds me of a story, a story of mine that was in the Sardini Post. The producer's jaw dropped and I realized I had caught them in the midst of being involved with my story without my knowing it, huh? Despite the admittedly sketchy behavior from the producers, Bradbury told them that he'd think about it, only to receive a telegram just the next day of them asking for the rights to his story. However, in Bill Warren's Keep Watching the Skies, American Science Fiction Movies of the 50s book from 2010, it tells a different version of the story that Bradbury himself apparently told the author. In this version, Bradbury didn't find out about the similarities between their movie outline and his short story until the actual screening of the movie. According to the text, due to Harryhausen and Bradbury's longtime friendship of 15 years at this point in time, when Harryhausen eventually finished up with the Monster from Beneath the Sea movie, he was excited to show his old friend and invited him to the screening. After the movie, Bradbury would then point out the similarities to Harryhausen, who was none the wiser that the producers essentially took elements of his friend's short story. 
How much Harryhausen actually knew about this isn't known. But Bradbury claims in Warren's book that the rights to his story weren't purchased until after the movie was already finished. And after the producers eventually did purchase the rights, they took advantage of the opportunity and changed the name of their film from The Monster from Beneath the Sea to the same title as Bradbury's short story, The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, likely as a way to capitalize off of the famous author's name. As a result of this, when Bradbury got around to making an anthology book called The Golden Apples of the Sun, which compiled some of his previous short story works including The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, he would end up changing the name from that to The Foghorn, seemingly as a way to get back at the filmmakers for attempting to use his work without asking him. And then of course, there's Ray Harryhausen's account of the story. Going back to the dinosaur filmography, Harryhausen admits that due to the amount of rumors and different people's perspectives on the matter, it's likely we'll never get a complete story of what actually ended up happening. He even states that he himself doesn't really know which account of the story to believe, before also stating that it would be hard for the monster from beneath the sea to be completely inspired by Bradbury's story, as a lot of the outline had apparently been made before Bradbury's short story was even published. According to his words, Dietz already had a script when I came on the project. It was just an outline when I read it, there was not even a concept of what the beast looked like. Though he would also say the image that accompanied Bradbury's short story in the Saturday Evening Post would prompt Dietz to buy the rights to The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms. Then, Harryhausen would retell the events from his perspective in the DVD featurette that I mentioned earlier, where he stated he was approached by Dietz, who was interested in having Harryhausen on board for their monster movie, after seeing his test footage for a dinosaur documentary film that was never fully made called Evolution. But according to the text in Keep Watching the Skies, it was Chester that approached Harryhausen after watching one of the movies he worked on, 1949's Mighty Joe Young. Regardless of how it went, Harryhausen would go to the studio and meet everyone, and together the group would begin working on the script, until one day, Dietz would come in with a copy of the Saturday Evening Post with Bradbury's story. I was approached by Jack Dietz about the beast from 20,000 Fathoms. Mr. Dietz uh, saw some of my tests that I made for evolution, and he wanted to see if I would be interested in, in doing the monster for this picture. And uh, so I went over to the studio and met Eugene Laurier, who was the art director at the time and the director. And uh, one day, when we were working on the script together, Jack Dietz came in with the Saturday Evening Post. It showed this beautiful illustration of the beast attacking a lighthouse, a big uh, sea monster, a story by Ray Bradbury. I thought, oh my God, I think he contacted you to yep. come in and read this, the script we had. And that's, at least from what I found, the extent of the confusion brought on by this movie around the beginning of its development. There's still a lot of questions that are unanswered. When did Bradbury actually find out about the film's similarities? Was it after watching the screening, or was it during the writing process? At what point were the rights bought? How come there's two different stories being told? Which one is the correct one? How much did Ray Harryhausen know about the producers using elements of his friend's story? What are Dietz and or Chester? recollection of the story. Like Harryhausen said earlier, there's likely never going to be a complete answer to any of these questions, but regardless, the movie would eventually go into production. As mentioned earlier, Ray Harryhausen was approached by one of the producers who asked him if he wanted to contribute to their upcoming monster movie. Whether it was Dietz or Chester, I'm not really sure, as there are two conflicting accounts from two different sources. Regardless, Harryhausen seemed interested, but was reluctant at first given the movie was going to have a low budget. Apparently, the film had a total budget of $200,000. Not as much as other stop-motion features, so certain methods that were used in big-budget films like King Kong and Mighty Joe Young would have to be excluded. 
Luckily, Harryhausen had a different method up his sleeve. One that was cheap and effective that would eventually be known as Dynamation, and the method was first used in The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms. Basically, the idea was that there would be a rear projector displaying an image on a screen in the background. In front of the screen would be a stand with the stop motion model on it. In front of the stand and model would be a matte glass pane and in front of the glass would be the camera. Two shots would be recorded, with each shot having a different area of the frame blacked out on the matte glass. The first shot would have the foreground blacked out so that the background and model can be recorded. And the second shot would have the background and the model blacked out so that only the foreground is recorded. The two separate shots would then be taken and composited together to put everything in the same frame, making it look like the monster was actually interacting with the people and surroundings. As far as the monster goes, which is known as the fiction dinosaur Redosaurus, the final design showcased a reptilian lizard-like dinosaur. However, early concept art by Harryhausen showcased monsters that looked quite different from the final product, as some versions weren't even of a dinosaurian creature, but rather tentacled aliens or dragon-like monsters. One of the more crazier designs had a serpent-like body with two heads and three pairs of legs. Of course, the idea was to make the monster prehistoric and not fantastic, so Harryhausen made something more grounded, a more reptilian looking monster, but decided to make one that was a combination of a lizard and triceratops, resulting in a frilled and beaked lizard monster thing. Another version was very close to what the Retosaurus would eventually become, though there were still some differences with this one, mainly with the ears and the snout. Another version made the creature much more grounded, though still looking different as it had kept the beak with a weird head shape that made it look more like a gargoyle than a dinosaur, though the body shape looked reptilian enough. Another version showed a slight change in the head structure, giving the Retosaurus a more lizard-like snout, though it was pushed in and resembled more of a puppy dog face. Along with that, at one point, this version also had long ears that were eventually ditched. Harryhausen would actually make a physical model of this version, but due to its almost cutesy look, it was modified to look more threatening. A second model was made, though it wasn't quite there yet. Third time was the charm, however, because after one more change, the Retosaurus was finally complete. Apparently, the reason why they decided to make it into a lizard-like dinosaur was because Harryhausen wanted a creature that was unique from his other dinosaur-related works, along with wanting the monster itself to look more threatening than its real-life counterparts. When the film was finally completed, Mutual Films attempted to sell it to RKO, since they had recently re-released 1933's King Kong in theaters just a year prior, but they weren't interested. However, other film studios were recognizing the potential in monster movies, one of them being Warner Brothers, and they ended up buying the movie from Mutual Films for about $400,000. They would make some slight changes to it and finally release it in theaters on June 13th, 1953. The movie starts with a group of scientists performing nuclear bomb tests in the Arctic Circle. Little do they know they awaken a prehistoric lizard-like like dinosaur called Retosaurus from its long dormant state. Now I wasn't able to find a whole lot of sources that really went into this aspect of the film in depth, but it's worth noting that The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms was one of, if not the earliest monster movie to use radioactive material as an element for the monster itself. In this case, the radioactive material was a part of the bombing test that just happened to wake the monster up. But considering the point in time this movie was made, it makes sense. This was about eight years after the United States dropped their atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki during World War II. And of course, only a couple of years after World War II ended, the Cold War would start, leading to even more nuclear bomb tests being conducted. It's no surprise that element would be used in movies to some extent during this point in time. Going back to the movie, one of the physicists, Tom Nesbitt, witnesses 
nurses the animal before getting knocked out and injured during the encounter with it. When he's sent back to the States, he attempts to tell his story about what he saw, but unsurprisingly, no one believes him. Nesbitt eventually meets with well-known paleontologist Dr. Thurgood Elson and his assistant Lee Hunter, in the hopes that they would listen. While Elson doesn't believe in Nesbitt's story, Hunter gives him a chance. Meanwhile, the monster makes its way towards New York, causing destruction on its way, both out at sea, sinking boats, and on land, destroying a lighthouse. And from what I can see, this seems to be the extent of the movie similarities with Bradbury's short story. Aside from Redosaurus's encounter with the lighthouse before destroying it, there's really nothing else the movie uses. There's not even a foghorn, and the lizard-like Redosaurus isn't completely accurate to what the more serpent-like dinosaur looked like in the short story, or at least the picture that accompanied the short story in its original publishing. Eventually, Nesbitt is able to gain the professor's belief of the monster after providing an eyewitness account from one of the more recent attacks. The trio make their way out to sea in the hopes of sighting the monster, with Elson and one other ship personnel descending into the ocean in a bathysphere, only to be attacked and killed by the Redosaurus. Shortly after, the monster makes its way into Manhattan, eating people, destroying cars, and tearing down buildings. Finally, the military get involved and attempt to kill the dinosaur, only managing to injure it on its neck using a bazooka. The shock causes the monster to bleed, and as a group of soldiers are following the blood trail, they almost immediately begin to feel ill. It's revealed the Retosaurus is carrying a prehistoric pathogen within its bloodstream that could potentially kill off even more people if it's continued to be shot by any military weaponry. So Nesbitt comes up with the idea of shooting the monster with a radioactive isotope that would not only kill the Retosaurus itself, but also neutralize the pathogen it's carrying. They locate the dinosaur at the Coney Island amusement park, so Nesbitt escorts a military sharpshooter to the top of the roller coaster via cart to get a better shot of the monster. They're able to get a direct hit on the Retosaurus's neck wound, but this angers the monster whose thrashing causes the cart to roll back down and eventually off the coaster, where it ignites a bunch of sparks after hitting the ground, which in turn causes the coaster to go up in flames. Luckily, the movie ends with the two men being able to make it off the coaster safely, and the Retosaurus succumbing to the radioactive isotope shot, putting the monster down for good. In my personal opinion of the movie, while I can appreciate the historical significance it holds, along with the great special effects work that went into it, the movie itself was nothing too great. Sure, it was the first of its kind, and yeah, it would lead to other monster movies getting certain elements down better, but that doesn't stop the movie itself from feeling very by the numbers and even a bit boring in some parts compared to the movies that would come after it. That being said, it wasn't awful and I still liked it overall, but it's just not a great movie. Regardless of what I think, back when the movie first came out, it was an absolute success, raking in about $5 million, which is a lot compared to the $400,000 that Warner Brothers invested into it. But making money wasn't the only thing that this movie was successful in. This movie actually has quite the legacy, but one of the best known examples is its contributions to 1954's Godzilla. In truth, there was a lot that led up to Godzilla's inception, most famously the events of World War II, when the United States dropped two atomic bombs in the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki just three days apart from each other, more specifically on August 6th and August 9th of 1945 respectively. The event would cause around 200,000 casualties, with most of them dying from the initial blast, but around 10% of the deaths were caused by radiation that were left behind by the bomb bombs, causing burns and other injuries. And of course, the events left the cities completely decimated, and nine years later, in 1954, when the idea for Godzilla was first conceived, the wounds were still far from being fully healed. In fact, a whole new wave of fear would emerge from an incident that also played a role of inspiration for the famous Japanese monster. This incident was known as the Lucky Dragon Incident, and it occurred in early spring of 1954. Despite being far from fully recovering, it seemed 
means that Japan was actually doing pretty well during this point in time. But as I mentioned earlier in the video, this was during a point in time in which the United States were still conducting nuclear bomb tests for a different conflict. The conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union during the Cold War would reignite the fear of another bombing, as both forces were performing their own experiments on nuclear weaponry. This conflict would prompt the US to conduct a bomb test that was called Operation Bravo, and was performed by the coral reefs of the Bikini Atoll, which was about 2,500 miles southwest of the Hawaiian city of Honolulu. This wasn't just any kind of bomb though. This was a 15 megaton H bomb that was measured to be 750 times more powerful than the bombs that were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It was far more powerful than expected, and when the bomb was detonated, it would cause radioactive debris to spread out over 7,000 square miles of the Pacific Ocean. And unfortunately, a Japanese fishing boat named Lucky Dragon, that was carrying 23 workers on it, would sail too far into the radiation zone after the bomb was detonated. As a result, everyone on the boat was covered with radioactive ash that would cause them to feel extremely sick within just a few hours. And within a span of about six months after the initial exposure to radioactive material, several of the men would tragically die because of it. The event would relaunch fear into the Japanese public space, and in turn, it would inspire Tanaka to make a monster movie that would showcase that fear. And given the success of King Kong's re-release in theaters in 1952, Japan's own monster movie seemed like a guaranteed success. Actually, from what I found out in my research, it seems that Tanaka didn't actually know about the Beast from 20,000 Fathoms until after he had already come up with the idea for Godzilla, which at the time went under the working title of The Monster from 20,000 Miles Beneath the Sea. In truth, this isn't the most definitive claim, and considering how similar the two concepts of the film are, it might be a little hard for some, if not most, to believe Tanaka didn't know about the Beast from 20,000 Fathoms before conceiving Godzilla. I mean, even the work in title sounds familiar to the American movie's name. But I felt the possibility was worth pointing out. Of course, take it with a grain of salt. However, the Beast from 20,000 Fathoms would contribute to certain elements of the film, at least based on what was written and illustrated early on in its development. An early draft of Godzilla, that was written by sci-fi and horror author Shigeru Kiyama, included a planned scene where Godzilla was actually going to attack a lighthouse as well, but this was never used. Along with that, according to the Illustrated Encyclopedia of Godzilla, it's pointed out that the early concept art of the monster had a resemblance to to Redosaurus. Admittedly, there's not much here, but the Beast from 20,000 Fathoms played more of a role than that for Godzilla's creation. In many ways, Godzilla took certain elements from the Beast from 20,000 Fathoms and improved on them, namely the atomic bomb part of the story. And it makes sense why these elements are used differently. Japan had gone through multiple events relating to the use of atomic weapons that directly affected hundreds of thousands of innocent lives. It left behind what was no doubt going to be decades of trauma and pain from the loss that their nation went through. So, where the US made a simple monster movie where the only aspect of an atomic bomb was used to wake up their monster from a long slumber, Japan made a movie where the monster, Godzilla, was meant to represent the bomb itself. Okay, yeah, admittedly, Godzilla also used the same concept of the monster being awakened by atomic bomb testings, but Godzilla himself has more of an allegory to real-world events than Redosaurus. Also, real quick, I don't want this coming off as a bad thing either. There's nothing wrong with making a monster movie as just a monster movie. Not everything has to have a deep message behind it to be good. The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms has his own strengths and weaknesses just like Godzilla, but everything I personally have to say about about it comes down to my personal opinions. But the fact of the matter is, even if Tanaka possibly conceived Godzilla before knowing about the beast from 20,000 Fathoms, the US monster movie still helped shift Godzilla into what he would eventually become in 1954, as it would use the metaphor of nuclear weapons as more of a cautionary tale. Another draft was written, this one being the final one, and with that, everything was set to go. With E.G. Tsuburaya at the helm of the movie's special effects, and Ishiro Honda hired as the director, they had their movie. 
What results is a movie about Japanese citizens experiencing a series of boat attacks out at sea from an unknown force. When one survivor is rescued and taken to a nearby village on Odo Island, he mentions a monster had attacked them. This, followed by fishing boats returning to the island with little to no catches, makes some believe this is due to the anger of what they think is a deity known as Godzilla. Later that night, a violent storm breaks out that destroys part of the village and killing many of the locals. However, a group of scientists and government officials are sent to investigate, including paleontologist Kiyohei Yamane, his daughter Amiko, and ship employee Hideto Ogata. While investigating the village, they find signs of radiation and even run into the monster itself when Godzilla appears over a hill and sends everyone running in the opposite direction. Yamane returns to Tokyo and concludes that Godzilla is some sort of prehistoric transitional species between aquatic reptiles and terrestrial animals during that point in time. It's guessed the creature was able to live off of deep sea organisms for all these years, before being disturbed by atomic bomb testing, similar to the idea for the beast from 20,000 Fathoms. As the attacks from Godzilla continue, there's differing ideas for what's to be done with the monster. Yamane wants to keep it alive to study, but everyone else seems keen on killing it off. Meanwhile, the movie also introduces us to Dr. Daisuke Serizawa, Yamane's associate who's actually engaged to Amiko, and is in this love triangle between her, himself, and Ogata. At one point during the movie, Amiko goes to talk with Serizawa in the hopes of breaking things off with him. Though when she arrives, she's distracted by something that Serizawa wants to show her. He shows her his experiment for a device that he calls the Oxygen Destroyer, which makes it so that when detonated, all oxygen atoms are disintegrated into fluids, causing anything within its range to asphyxiate and dissolve. Despite the breakthrough, he makes her promise her secrecy to his project. However, this is hard to do, especially after Godzilla makes another appearance this time in Tokyo. Despite trying to hold back the monster with electric fences and military brigades, Godzilla rampages through, stomping through the streets and engulfing the city in flames with its atomic breath. Eventually, fighter jets are able to chase the monster away back into the sea. With the mass destruction to the city and the high amount of casualties, Amiko breaks her silence about the oxygen destroyer to Ogata, and the two go back to Serizawa in the hopes of convincing him to use his device against Godzilla. At first, Serizawa refuses, worried that if he reveals his invention, the world will create more of it and use it on each other, and all of that bloodshed would be on his conscience. It isn't until a program on TV comes on that showcases the outcome of Godzilla's rampage, where Serizawa is finally convinced to reveal his oxygen destroyer, but burns away all of his writings and notes about it to keep anyone else from recreating it. In the final sequence of the movie, Serizawa and Ogata go out to sea by ship and scuba dive their way down to the bottom of the ocean, where Godzilla wanders. Serizawa activates the device, and before he can get pulled back up, he cuts his line. To the scientist, the only way to ensure the oxygen destroyer doesn't fall into the wrong hands is if all trails leading back to it are destroyed, including him. Ogata is sent back up to the ship and the oxygen destroyer goes off, killing both Serizawa and Godzilla. The movie ends on a bittersweet note and a meaningful message. Serizawa's sacrifice made it so everyone else could survive and live on, including Amiko and Ogata. But the movie ends with Dr. Yamane saying that if humanity continues nuclear testing, then another Godzilla might appear. It goes without saying that Godzilla ended up being a box office hit. The total amount seems to fluctuate, especially when you take consideration in the American version of the film called Godzilla King of the Monsters, which was re-edited to have Canadian-American actor Raymond Burr inserted into the film. This cut of the film also did well in the States, and together the movie made somewhere between $2 million and $4 million. Given the movie's success, a sequel titled Godzilla Raids Again was rushed out, though it didn't have have nearly the same amount of fanfare as the first one, since people seem to instantly recognize it as a cash grab to its more meaningful and allegorical predecessor. Even without taking the money into consideration, just looking at the sheer amount of films the franchise had pumped out since then is a testament to the original film's overall success, which is only further corroborated by the fact that it's still going to this day. Although, admittedly, not everyone was a fan of Godzilla, one of these people being Ray Harryhausen himself. 
He seemed rather bitter towards the movie's franchise due to his dislike of the suitmation method for the giant monsters, and possibly even due to the fact that maybe he thought Toho's movie was too similar to his own giant monster destroying city movie. Maybe he thinks he's owed to some extent, but in truth, it's hard to tell how definitive this story is. That being said, there are definitely some elements, at the very least, from the American monster movie that were used in Godzilla. And in that sense, I think at least least some thanks are owed to the contributions from the Beast from 20,000 Fathoms. Well, the Godzilla franchise is no doubt the biggest thing to come from the Beast from 20,000 Fathoms. Even if it was a partial contribution, the American Monster movie has left behind a lot more than just that. The movie would contribute to several other giant monster movies that became a popular trend for movie studios to make throughout the 50s, including them, a movie about giant monstrous ants that, in turn, helped kickstart the giant bug craze in monster movies. Along with these films, Eugene Laurier would go on to direct two more monster movies that feature giant dinosaurs, including The Giant Behemoth in 1959 and Gorgo in 1961, which were possibly inspired by his debut movie in one way or another. The Retosaurus itself would end up making multiple different appearances ranging from comics, like the 104th issue of the original Batman comic from 1956, to movies like 1977's Planet of Dinosaurs. In the movie, there's a sequence where the Tyrannosaur has a brief battle with the scaled-down Retosaurus before the lizard dinosaur is ultimately killed. For this movie, the Retosaurus was designed by Steven Zirkus, who was a fan of Ray Harryhausen's fictional dinosaur. So much so, the team decided to make it a cameo in their movie. And finally, the Retosaurus model was also repurposed for a different Harryhausen film called The Seventh Voyage of Sinbad, where it was altered and remodeled to look more like a dragon. And of course, there's the story that started it all, The Foghorn. The short story would be republished in different anthology books containing other Ray Bradbury stories. It was published under the title of The Foghorn in the Golden Apples of the Sun book in 1953, with 21 other Bradbury short stories. A play adaptation of the story was also made and put into a collection of other play adaptations of two other Bradbury stories, Pillar of Fire and Kaleidoscope. This collection was called Pillar of Fire and Other Plays, and it was published in 1975. In 1983, Bradbury published a dinosaur-themed anthology book called Dinosaur Tales that contained his collection of dinosaur short stories, including The Foghorn. Along with that, Topps Comics would gather some of Bradbury's short stories and make comic adaptations of them in 1993, with The Foghorn being one of them. This version of the story was adapted by Wayne D. Barlow, and features a similar story to Bradbury's original shorts, only this time the monster that attacks the lighthouse is more akin to that of an elasmosaur rather than it being some kind of fictional four-legged reptilian serpent. And finally, the short story would also inspire the 1997 Pokemon episode Mystery at the Lighthouse, which aired on June 24th of that year. Now, I'll admit, I'm not a Pokemon fan. Never have been, probably never will be. It's not my thing and I'm not going to sit here and explain an episode of something that I have no interest in. So instead, I'm going to have my girlfriend do it because she is a massive nerd and really loves Pokemon. Hi, I'm Gambit. I'm the one who helps Diego with art and stuff. He was so kind to let me help with this portion of the video because he knows just how much I love Pokemon and um, because he's a great boyfriend and he spoils me fucking rotten. Now that my little introduction is out of the way, let me get to the good stuff. So to anyone who doesn't know, the Pokemon Indigo League series is an anime based off the famous Pokemon video games from the 90s where we follow Ash Ketchum and his iconic little yellow Pikachu on his first adventures. It's the introductory series that helps viewers understand the world of Pokemon in ways they couldn't within the video game. This episode, titled Mystery of the Lighthouse, begins with Ash Ketchum brandishing his six newly acquired Pokemon, as the series is still in its infancy. His confidence is quickly dampened by his two friends Brock and Misty, however, as all of his Pokemon have followed him rather than have been captured by him. To prove himself capable, Ash scrambles to a nearby beach in search of a Pokemon to capture. He does so quickly, catching a Krabby that he manages to irritate with little effort. However, 
after adding the crustacean-like Pokemon to his collection, Ash finds that he can only have up to six Pokemon at a time on his team, so it's sent away to Professor Oak to care for. Brock and Misty go into a short game-like tutorial showing Ash how to swap out his Pokemon once he's done lamenting his temporary loss. This is a small throwback to the video game itself. Wanting to check on his Krabby, Ash and his friends spot a lighthouse on the beach and decide to make their way over quickly so that Ash can contact the professor, as he doesn't exactly trust the old man to not cook the Krabby. When they reach the lighthouse, they speak with the keeper through his front speaker, Brock bartering with his cooking skills so they may be allowed in and offered a brief reprieve from their journey. Upon being let into the rather derelict lighthouse, Ash asks to use the phone, which the lighthouse keeper happily allows. Ash calls the professor to find that his Krabby is well taken care of and then finds out that his rival has caught about 45 Pokemon and a Krabby bigger than his own. Go fucking figure. Professor Oak reveals over the call that the lighthouse keeper is actually a Pokemon researcher named Bill, who then takes in the trio to teach them about Pokemon at the professor's request. I swear to God, I'm going somewhere with this. At last, Bill reveals himself from the darkness that he was hiding in. He's stuck in a costume modeled after an extinct fossil Pokemon named Kabuto. All the while, Team Rocket is plotting to break into this lighthouse. With Ash's help, Bill is released and then begins to explain to Ash and his friends how he studies other Pokemon like Kabuto. Atop the lighthouse, Bill tells the trio of a Pokemon he's in search of, one that's the largest that's ever been heard of, and one that's more than likely the only one of its kind. This is where the episode finally begins to derive its story from the Foghorn. And let me tell you, it's a whole 15 fucking minutes into a 21 minute episode on God, this shit fucking drags, okay? Indigo League was something else, all right? This is the very beginning. I swear to God, it took too goddamn long, but I'm just a Johto bitch, okay? What do I fucking know? Anyways, uh, moving on. Bill describes how the Pokemon calls to him at the lighthouse in search of friends and how he's managed to record that call, returning it and trying to reach out in order to befriend the Pokemon so it won't be lonely anymore. Of course, on the very night it appears, the Pokemon is a ginormous Dragonite that sings to everyone atop the lighthouse. It's call lulling the group and even Team Rocket for a few passing moments. James also makes a size does matter joke about the Dragonite, by the way. That's a big Pokemon. So size does matter. And I'm only just now realizing this at 25 fucking years old. Despite its gentle cries, Team Rocket, of course, ruins the peace and attacks the Dragonite, causing the creature to lash out and attack them. Bill begs for the Pokemon to stay, but it shakes its head no and leaves. The episode ends on Bill and Ash's small gang actually not knowing it's a Dragonite. Only the viewers do. And they merely reflect on how to care for and learn about Pokemon. A bit cheesy, but this was 25 years ago when there were only about 150 Pokemon, as opposed to like, today's 1,000 and something. But it was cute filler for its time. A fun little find. And uh, it was fun to write the script for it. So I can't complain. Thanks for having me, D. Love ya. And that was the story of the beast from 20,000 Fathoms and its association with one of the world's most famous franchises. If you guys enjoyed this video, leave a like and subscribe. If you want to find more ways to support the channel, you can check out my Patreon page for exclusive content for $3 a month, or become a channel member for $1 a month for exclusive emojis. Speaking of Patreon, as always, I want to thank my patrons for all your support towards the channel. Huge thanks to Eric, Julian, Galactic Breaker, Studio DM Wing, Darwinius, James, Gambit, Greasy Pulsating Frog, and Inquisitor Zarius. I appreciate you all, thank you all so much for watching, and please, have a nice day.